the burning of the points can has a number of um, a number of uh, ways to diagnose what's going on. They're not just burned between the contacts. If you have two contacts that are both burned considerably, um, what that usually indicates is you've got too much current flowing through the uh, points. Okay, and that could be because you have fitted a different coil that uh, does not have the appropriate ballast resistance in it. Um, some coils come with a ballast resistance of 1.5 ohms in them. So you can tell the difference between an internal ballast resistor coil has 3 ohms and a non-internal ballast resistor coil only has 1.5 ohms across the primary. So if you were to put 1.5 ohms there, um, and if you had 3 ohms in your system, okay, at 12 volts, you're going to get 4 amps current across your points. So if you put 1.5 ohms, you're going to get 8 amps across your points, and they are going to belt, burn, and they're going to look very burnt on both sides. Now, in the condition where your condenser is burned, if your condenser is not functioning, like completely not functioning, you'll get a bridge in one direction. You'll get one polarity, which is a divot in one side of the points and a bridge in the other side of the points, where the, the, um, the condenser is not doing the function of, of continuing the, 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 the spark, okay? Uh, sorry, continuing the voltage down and di until the coil dissipates. Um, likewise, if you've got a capacitor or a condenser that's too big, you'll actually get the same sort of thing but in the opposite direction. So if you put a coil in that's got a slightly different impedance in it, maybe you take the standard coil out, you put one of those old Bosch, popular was putting the Bosch GT40 coil, GT40R coils was the, the mod. Um, it might change the uh, characteristics of the impedance inside the coil and if you didn't put the appropriate condenser to match that, then you would get this effect of a slight um, build up on one side of the points. Um, you'd still have a condenser, they wouldn't burn because it would allow the voltage to continue through the condenser when the points open. You'll have a bias in one direction and you'll you'll get this pitting. So that was basically how we diagnosed that on the points and then we'd have a look at the oscilloscope and we could actually see the, see the uh, condenser in operation and check the oscillations were even. So um, that's the switching side, um, turning the coil on um, for a period and then turning it off to release the voltage, high voltage into the distributor. So that would be timed to open the points just as the rotor button was pointing at the proper cylinder. And that cam would have six lobes in a six cylinder and six plug leads in a six cylinder on the distributor cap. Now the coil, as I said before, had uh, ballast resistors external and internal um, and um, a lot of most cars had um, with it with a um, didn't have an internal ballast resistor in the coil had an external one the Japanese ones had one bolted alongside the coil which was like a ceramic block um, was around a one to one and a half ohm and other cars uh, like GM had a ballast resistor in the actual wiring harness um, before the between the ignition switch and the coil, which was about 0.6 of an ohm. Um, most of the systems uh, had a separate voltage um, from the starter switch. When you uh, um, start the car uh, in this configuration with the ballast resistor in line there or one alongside, um, a starter signal would signal, in some cases, a relay um, with the external resistor here. Or signal another voltage directly to the coil and it would give 12 volts directly to the coil and bypass the ballast resistor when the engine was actually being cranked over. So having only 1.5 ohms and no ballast inside there we would get 8 amps across the points during starting, during cranking and then when the key was let go and ignition remained on it would be the value of the coil and the ballast resistor be it external or in the arms. Um, which would bring it down to our, um, our 4 to 5 amps. And that's how it gave it a bit of boost of voltage just during cranking, as well as the condenser um, causing this oscillation, giving us a high energy at the coil at low engine speeds as well. So that is how the Kettering ignition system worked um, with points 
and um, condenser and there was various types of other triggers which I'll get into but I'll just cover the rest of the distributor um, the other part of it was the advanced systems in the bottom of the distributor or in some cases in the top above the actual uh, um, cam or points trigger or, or, or circuit breaker mechanism um, sometimes the mechanical advance could be just underneath the rotor button the big wide one on the uh, GM ones and stuff and these Bosch ones are usually in the bottom but essentially um, those little pins are connected to weights and those weights are fixed at this point and when the distributor spins the base part of the distributor spins the weights move outwards in these slots causing this cam or this uh, reluctor or whatever it was in this case points cam to advance okay so in this distributor we're going the other way we're going that way okay so um, the road is going that way it's opening at a certain point it, as the weights move out that's no speed that's high speed full speed as the weights would move out it would advance further and that would be the curve of our advance in uh, ignition timing over the RPM range. Note a small gauge wire spring, a thick gauge wire spring. This was the curve, this determined the curve, this spring, for the first part of the engine speed. And then when it, it got to this one, this spring was a little bit loose. You see it had a longer eye, so that would be loose and not come into contact. So because the spring is between the base plate, it's not attached to the weights. Um, both weights applying will apply tension on one spring to advance this. So we had a higher amount of advance during the first part of the engine RPM, and then this would touch and we'd get the stronger spring, and that would slow down the curve of advance as the RPM increased to maximum. Okay. So if you ever encounter a distributor for any reason and you're going to fix it and you find a spring missing, they're not the same. One's low speed, one's high speed. So that's the actual mechanical advance system. Um, show you up here a distributor. We'll see here the uh, the lobe distributor lobe for opening and closing the points and the advance weights below. So the lobe is actually concentric on that shaft and loose on the shaft. Uh, this is the fixed shaft that goes down to the camshaft or, or um, camshaft speed from the oil pump. And so this gives us a mechanical advance. For this one, this is uh, attached to the top plate. The cam, the points were fixed to a top plate, and there was two plates, one stacked one on top of the other. And these parts were actually fixed to the top plate, and the bottom plate had tabs that screwed into the body of the distributor. And so the top plate could actually rotate backwards and forwards sitting on the top of the, the other plate with uh, usually little ball bearings and a spring plate underneath to actually hold it in place and allow it to rotate. That was attached to this arm. It would be pulled by a vacuum dashpot, a vacuum diaphragm in there, which was the vacuum advance. Vacuum advance would be taken from the carburetor base plate or the throttle plate, not below it because we don't want uh, vacuum at idle speed from the manifold vacuum. We only want to advance at cruising. So uh, it's taken from around the throttle plate. So when there's a, uh, um, a low throttle angle, we get uh, our pedostatic effect with the tube, with the port in the carburetor throat, like I explained in the earlier videos with carbs. And that would draw the vacuum and pull the disc plate with the points in the opposite direction of rotation. So this one rotates that way, the plate would be pulled in the opposite direction, advancing the points, whereas the mechanical advance advances the actual rotor itself in the center. Um, but this would only operate at cruise to give it extra advanced fuel economy. And then once you accelerate and uh, you've got a higher um, throttle plate angle, you don't get any signal that should turn off. So when we used a timing light to check the mechanical advance was working, we would have to disconnect the vacuum so that as we increased the RPM and we had a, a low position throttle in neutral with a high engine speed, we wouldn't be getting any vacuum advance. 
and we could actually see the curve of the mechanical advance working in line with the engine speed and then plug the vacuum advance in and test it again and see the vacuum advance increase upon the on some in addition to the actual mechanical advance um, that'll do it for now and uh, we'll come back we'll cover about uh, a bit more of the dynamic operation looking at the scope patterns I used to read those um, a lot and uh, yeah that'll do it for today okay we're gonna get